So I see we have a full room of participants. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm so happy to welcome you to our webinar um, and introduce our speakers. We have a wonderful panel today um, and a really a great topic. Um, we'll be talking today about assessing ability to pay in today's courts um, and looking towards the future and its relationship uh, with ODR, of course. Um, we have two wonderful panelists today. Um, they are Judge Alexis Crott. She is the um, 31st District Court Judge here in Michigan. Um, the 31st District Court is in Hamtramck, Michigan, which is a separate municipality within the borders of the city of Detroit. Prior to taking the bench, Judge Crott practiced business, criminal, and family law in Michigan courts and served as the assistant city attorney for the city of Hamtramck and the magistrate for the 31st district court. She's involved in many community groups and events in Hamtramck as well. So she's had many roles within the court and I believe brings a great perspective um, to our panel today. Welcome Judge Crott and welcome everybody. Our next panelist is um, Professor of Law, J.J. Prescott. Um, he is Professor of Law at the University of Michigan, um, the Principal Investigator at the University of Michigan Online Court Project, which uses technology to help people facing warrants, fines, and minor charges revolve, resolve their disputes um, with government and courts online and without the need necessarily to hire an attorney the U of M Online Court Project was the inspiration for Matterhorn by Court Innovations, which is where I work. Uh, my name is Donnery Greiling, and I will be the moderator for today's panel. Um, I will uh, be forwarding the slides as well as taking your questions and get, getting them answered by our panelists. So welcome, JJ. Welcome, Judge Crott. Judge Crott, I can't see you, um, so you might want to turn your video on, um, but you don't need to do that necessarily until your section because we are going to start with JJ. So JJ, why don't you um, start us off on why we're here, what the motivation was, and let's talk about ability to pay and ass assessment in today's courts. Great, so thank you, Dunry, and thank you all for being here. Um, so I, I, I'm just going to start with a, just a little bit of background on, on Matterhorn generally, and to give you, you know, a quick, uh, uh, you know, a, a quick uh, version of the story of, you know, how it came to be. Uh, you, you know, a, a bunch of years ago now, um, you, you know, a number of us became very worried about the millions of outstanding warrants in the U.S. And the real question is, you know, what's causing what's causing all of these warrants, why, when you know that if you can get a, a litigant into the, uh, the court um, uh, with a judge, you can usually find a resolution. Why do we see so many sort of failed resolutions? And the answer, of course, is, um, uh, is you know, uh, it, it are, are the challenges of actually getting to courthouses. So unlike uh, so many other institutions in, um, uh, in today's world, uh, it is uh, still the case that courts are operating mostly on a brick and mortar um, type of, of framework. So, you know, that means that, um, especially for lower level types of things, the actual physical challenge of getting to court, the fact that you have to take off work, that you have to wait oftentimes in lines just because that's how scheduling has to work. Um, moreover, there are psychological um, uh, um, aspects to this as well, especially for those who are poor um, or who, you know, who are, who are less sophisticated, have less education, um, confused by courts, are intimidated by courts, are oftentimes um, put in a position where they have to publicly speak in order to kind of get their points across. And that, and that is all um, uh, had the result of actually limiting um, uh, uh, people's ability and even their willingness to use courts. And, and of course the consequence is a ton of, of outstanding warrants and also more generally just a ton of unresolved uh, cases. Uh, so, so this is where uh, Matterhorn um, uh, came from. The goal was to essentially connect people using an online platform, uh, you know, designed to, to, to mimic um, uh, how each individual court works at the direction of courts at, with the consultation of uh, judges and 
um, and, and court administrators and the like to kind of design a process where people could connect easily from the comfort of their own homes to, to resolve uh, uh, their outstanding, um, uh, their outstanding um, issues. So, uh, so that has led to, um, uh, Dunry, can we go to the next slide? I'm not sure if you're uh, yeah, so you know, so that so that's really the goal of the platform is to to, to overcome these hurdles, all of the ones I described, and to resolve, um, and to get cases resolved. Um, and uh, and Matterhorn has now evolved into a, a bunch of different um, uh, protocols, uh, including um, uh, Dunry. Next slide. I don't know if you want me to tell you when to move to the next slide, but I'm kind of moving on to the next uh, slides. Uh, so the uh, so to, you know today we we have a bunch of um, uh, a bunch of different uh, 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 tools, solutions that can be used for um, opening up courts and making courts easier and more effective. But today we're gonna talk about ability to pay, which is the orange um, uh, hexagon there at the bottom. Uh, and, um, and let me just step back a little bit and tell you something about um, the use of fines. So, you know, I'm, I'm a law professor, I teach criminal law. I don't actually spend very much time on the use of fines as sanctions. Um, but uh, you know, I'm also an economist, and and actually, fines are in in uh, from a theoretical perspective, sort of the most efficient uh, uh, form of sanction. And the reason is is that um, they are essentially transfers. So when somebody needs to be uh, punished or or um, has to you know pay for something they've done, they you know they 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 both incur a loss, but they generate a benefit by handing that over to the court or over to the government, which can then use those resources in some other way. Compare um, incarceration, which is costly on both sides. So it's costly both to the, uh, to the person who, who is incarcerated as well as um, uh, uh, to the government that is imposing the sanction. Now, there are a bunch of limitations on fines, which is why we don't use them, even though they are technically um, uh, you know, sort of more efficient. One is, you know, you, a lot of people feel like you're pricing um, harms. So when somebody hurts you, if there's a, a fine you pay, it's essentially putting a price on violating somebody's rights. We don't, we don't like that. That doesn't feel right. Um, for people who need to be incapacitated, that's not, um, you, you know, fines aren't, aren't going to do the same sort of job. And of course, uh, the ability to pay fines is, is distributed very um, uh, unequally across society. And so um, unlike, we all, you know, we all have bodies and, and being incarcerated for a day, um, you know, at least plausibly feels the same to everybody, um, but um, paying fines um, uh, doesn't matter. Uh, it, does, it doesn't feel quite the same depending on how much you have. Now, of course, <clears throat> uh, want, you know, the thing we often forget in thinking about uh, fines as being um, efficient is that you, you still have to enforce them. So, and, and as many of you know, who work at courts, uh, getting people to pay their fines is a huge challenge. Uh, in my view, looking across many systems, we oftentimes uh, spend four or five to collect six, um, and um, and it's it's too bad that we you know we waste a lot of what we could do with those fines um, in just trying to get them to come in. Um, but even if we think um, more generally about the use of fines, one of the key assumptions is that people actually have money to pay them, right? So if you impose a uh, you know, we don't usually think about this in the context of incarceration, where um, if somebody has a body, you can incarcerate it. But with fines, you actually have to have um, you have to have the ability to pay in order for the sanction to make sense. So, can we go to the next slide, Dunner? Okay, great. So, um, you know, this concern is 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 well understood. I mean, you know, among among law professors and, and people who think about when we ought to use these different sanctions for serious crimes. I mean, the thought of coming up with a, a fine for some serious crime like, like murder or um, assault, uh, uh, you know, it wouldn't, it's not surprising to think that a, a lot of Americans wouldn't have the money to pay that kind of fine. But we spend a lot less time thinking about um, uh, fines for minor transgressions. So if you, you know, traffic infraction, uh, parking, and so on, there we typically assume that the average, and it's indeed right that the average American can, um, uh, can access uh, the money that uh, they need to pay a fine that is kind of optimized for that sort of harm. Now, um, uh, this isn't true though for the, for the poor. So there's, there's a good chunk of society where paying those fines is either impossible or a real challenge 
and, um, and where somebody is unable to pay a fine um, or a fee or something they owe to the government, then it's actually, um, uh, it's actually counterproductive to force them uh, uh, to pay it because if they can't do it, uh, then what we do is we wind up generating a lot of costs um, uh, and, and, that doesn't, and that doesn't help us. So, so ultimately accuracy becomes really important when we're talking about fines as applies to, uh, applied to people who are poor. And, and there can be two types of errors, essentially uh, people who can pay uh, but are deemed to be um, unable to pay. Um, you know, this is not great. We, you know, we, we, uh, we, you know, somebody gets away with committing an infraction and, and um, they're not punished. Uh, we don't have that money to use um, to fund criminal justice or courts. Um, but it's a, much less serious than the error that goes the other way, um, in which somebody who is unable to pay has been deemed able to pay. When that happens, we sort of get a cascade of problems. Um, and those problems can be so serious, as many of you know, um, that it, it really becomes critical to make sure that we make that determination um, uh, correctly, whether somebody is able to pay a fine or fee before we sort of enforce, enforce it. Okay, next slide, please. Um, all right, so um, that's what courts are trying to do, as many of you know, is they're trying to determine essentially whether somebody's unable to pay or whether they are refusing uh, to pay. And in extreme cases, this is really you know, quite easy. You know, somebody who has a uh, million dollars in the bank can pay a traffic ticket. Uh, somebody who is um, ill and in the hospital and has not a dime to their name probably can't pay. Uh, but of course, there are a, a, a bunch of um, closer cases where somebody may be working a, um, a low wage job, has a number of um, uh, costs and, uh, and expenses in their lives, um, a number of dependents and so on, where these are much closer calls. So um, we know from uh, the Supreme Court in 1983 decision of Bearden versus Georgia that, that if a court determines that you are unable to pay, um, then it's, it's inappropriate for the court to enforce, uh, enforce that fine, and in particular to enforce it by um, jailing you. Um, we also know that if somebody, you know, uh, I think the typical framework would be if you're found to be unable to pay, then, you know, the law would require at bet, you know, if you want to try to, um, uh, to, to um, impose some kind of punishment, then the next question is to, to consider restructuring. So reducing the amount that somebody is obligated to pay, um, putting them on a payment plan, perhaps using alternative sanctions um, in, in lieu of um, the full initial fine. Um, and, uh, and, and so that's, that's kind of the two-step process. First, is a person unable to pay or are they refusing to pay? And if they are unable to pay the current uh, fine as, as it has been structured, can I restructure it as a, as a, as a judge or somebody who's working with somebody, um, you know, a litigant or defendant at a court, can I restructure this to, to, to make it so they then become able to comply? Next slide, please. Uh, okay, so what do we know about these decisions? Essentially, there's, there's, uh, there's, there's no law on this. I mean, we know that you cannot put people in jail for being unable to pay, but how we determine that um, uh, is, is not, you know, you know, hasn't been spoken to. So of course, many courts have their own practices. Many states are trying to um, determine um, how to approach this problem, um, uh, you know, either at the, uh, you know, at the administrative office level or at the Supreme Court level. Um, the consequences are immense, especially if when somebody doesn't pay a fine, courts attempt to enforce it by, for example, you know, issuing a warrant, suspending a license. Um, you know, these things impose a ton of costs on society. License suspensions in particular, as many of you know, even if they may be effective for somebody who is refusing to pay, they are much less effective for somebody who's actually unable to pay. Um, if they uh, if they stretch and maybe borrow money um, from people or do something um, you know perhaps uh, you know something we don't even want them to do to get a hold of the cash it's obviously counterproductive and um, of course what some courts do is is just add further fines and fees to somebody who's not able to pay and you know and things like um, you know having your license suspended make it more difficult for you to comply because it makes it more difficult for you to hold a job. And outstanding warrants, of course, cause people to avoid the police, to 
to, to avoid the courts, to not call the police when they um, when they need help, when they're being victimized, and to generally steer free, you know steer clear of anything where um, somebody might uh, might seek to arrest them. So so once you think about these and you you know these significant consequences, the importance of accuracy in determining whether somebody's unable to pay just seems uh, absolutely uh, you know. It, it, I mean, it just, it's surprising it doesn't get more attention than it does, although I think in the last few years it has gotten a lot more. And, you know, I'll just say that if, if we're not doing um, uh, the, the determination of ability to pay, if, you know, well, then, I mean, fines become arguably no longer efficient. I mean, if we, you know, if, if we really have way, you, you, we're generating a lot of social cost by people being asked to pay fines they can't afford, um, it's really unclear whether that's the way we should be uh, trying to enforce um, uh, minor offenses, minor uh, you know laws. So how do they actually do this in, in practice? Well, some of you will know that because courts have a great deal of discretion and, and judges have a great deal of discretion in determining this, um, there are a bunch of ways. So I'm sure uh, some of you have heard uh, stories, but of course, you know there are documented cases of judges asking about tattoos, asking about, you know, a piece of clothing that is expensive. Um, uh, there, you know, there's an anecdote of uh, of a judge who, you know, would 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 just declare as a as a matter of law that anybody who smokes has the ability to pay, right? So, you know, if they if they can sustain a habit um, of of cigarette smoking, then they have um, the ability to pay. You know, the stories you hear of people looking at shoes and saying, "Well, those are expensive shoes." So this person must be able to pay. Um, now, all of these things are potentially relevant. And the question is whether or not they're given more weight in a lot of determinations than they, than they ought to, and whether or not there are cultural assumptions that go along with uh, pointing uh, to some of these, uh, these considerations. So, um, you know, uh, different groups in society can, can, um, uh, can prioritize how they spend their money in different ways. And um, it doesn't necessarily imply that they are any less um, uh, close to the line or on the other side of the line from an inability to pay perspective. Now, the way our system usually works in these uh, uh, circumstances is, you know, we require, we, we, we rely on the adversarial system. We rely on the fact that people can defend themselves, get up and actually say, hey, I, you know, it's true, I, I have this jacket, but here's the story about how I have it. It was a gift, I tried to sell it. I don't know how to sell it. Um, you know, I can only sell it for five bucks on eBay and it would cost me five bucks to mail it. So it just doesn't, doesn't make any sense. And here's all of the things you ought to be taking into account. But, but, but this doesn't really work when we're dealing with um, unrepresented uh, uh, defendants who, who oftentimes uh, don't have um, familiarity with how the court works or the ability to represent themselves uh, very well. So for example, there are plenty of people who don't even, you know, they don't even know about Bearden versus Georgia, that, you know, that they can't be jailed when they're unable to pay. So the, you know, the fact that it, you know, in their view, it may be irrelevant whether they have the money or not, or have the capacity to get the money or not, um, uh, could help explain why, uh, why judges wind up not getting the information they need, even though normally we tend to rely on that. So ultimately what we wind up with in many circumstances is decisions with insufficient context. We have lots of judges who are making decisions um, based on questions they ask that are not informed by the full panoply of information that might be really relevant. Um, and of course, the, uh, the, the litigant or the defendant, him or herself, can't bring to bear the things that the judge ought to be taking into account, at least not in any kind of systemic way. Sorry, skipped one. So, so let me just uh, just quickly, just very quickly, because I know I'm taking a lot of time here. Um, I want to you, know, you just say that you know the, the 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 importance of this determination has not been lost on uh, on many courts, and and some of you may be in systems where there has been some uh, some change and some attempt to deal with this. And the solutions fall into the categories you see here on the slide. You know, more robust legal standards, essentially giving people more the benefit of the doubt. So changing what it means. Um, to be unable to pay, uh, to being something more like likely to be, you know, unable to pay, or changing the the, the standards so that it's 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 easier on the on the on the defendant um, using list-based definitions. So rather than um, uh, just having a single uh, phrase or a single term, um, actually kind of 
laying out the kinds of things that ought to be considered. So for example, whether the person has any defendants, whether the person is employed, whether the person has any disabilities, these things can be actually incorporated into a definition of, um, uh, of, of the standard for whether somebody is um, able to pay. Some states have gone with um, required hearings. So it, you know, if we start from the assumption that some people out there are not gonna know that they could ask for um, the judge to think about their ability to pay, then one way we can deal with that is just by making sure that every judge actually, actually goes through, um, uh, uh, through the step of, of, of considering whether the defendant before them is able to pay a fine or fee um, to make sure that, um, so th that it's just not missed. Um, and you can also require that the judge put you know, some finding about their ability to pay on, on record so that somebody can um, raise it or, or examine it later. There's also bench checklists. So, you know, things that kind of reminders for judges to, um, uh, to, 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 to check or to ask about uh, so, that they, um, so that they can collect hopefully more consistent, more uh, comprehensive information. Um, we've actually gone at this a slightly different way. You know, we, you know, in, in thinking about how to solve this, of course, reforming the law and changing how systems um, uh, work is very difficult. And in particular, you, you know, we hire judges and we choose them because of their ability to, 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 to think in a sort of um, complicated, nuanced um, uh, environment with lots of pieces of information flying around. Uh, and it's very hard to, to think about how to write something down on paper that will effectively um, uh, guide judges in a consistent way. So, so we've, we've done it a little bit differently um, in what we've tried to do in this space, which is to focus on the informational environment. In other words, you know, continue to, to, to make the judge front and center um, and, um, and instead try to um, increase the, the ability of the, of the defendant or the offender to participate in the process, to, to share information quickly and to improve decision-making. So uh, by that, I mean, you know, not require that the judge ask all the questions or that the judge collate all the information or that the judge um, um, make sure that, that everything is being um, uh, caught. You know, actually the judge going through the checklist, that, that's un, unnecessary. So with technology today, especially if you have an online platform, it's, it's pretty easy to, to have um, what the judge sees before them um, sort of designed um, in advance and the information collected in advance so that actually you can wind up having more information, better information, consistently collected information and presented to a judge um, right then and there um, so they can actually spend less time thinking about it than they otherwise would. I'm not sure if that's my last slide or if there's one more. So, 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 um, uh, so what, what, what our uh, uh, tool, Matterhorn's tool does is, is, is try to accomplish a lot, you know, as I just said, accomplish a lot of this um, by using the online platform uh, uh, approach. So uh, the defendant can access the court, not by coming in with paper documents, but can come in and actually, um, uh, it, it, sorry, can, can access the court, the judge, the ability to pay a, a solution from home at any time of day, can upload documents, do all the things they need to do um, uh, to get the information in front of the judge. Uh, the judge doesn't actually have to do this collection. It happens sort of automatically. Um, then the, the, the program can actually distill this information, sort of present it in a way where a judge can dig in more deeply or can, uh, can look for sort of the big picture. You know, where does this person, based on all of the information they put in, where do they fit uh, with respect to the poverty line? You know, how much can they afford per month? These kinds of calculations can all be done in advance. Um, uh, you know, and the, the sort of menu-driven approach of this whole thing makes sure that, um, that judges have access to everything they might want to see, even if many judges uh, don't want to see it on a regular basis. So you wind up with more information, better information, um, and yet it requires actually less time and effort on the part of the court. Now, it may require a little bit more time and effort on the part of the um, litigant, at least in the sense of, you know, if they actually try to submit information, um, uh, it, it might take a little bit more time, but of course, it's enough of a challenge already that so many people 
just don't even, you know, they don't, they don't even participate uh, in this and they wind up being determined able to pay or, or I should say, there's never any determination that they're unable to pay um, and uh, they wind up in, in, in a much worse uh, situation. So I think, I think that's probably for me. Uh, I think I'm all done for now. Thank you, thank you. So I wanna make sure for everybody who just joined um, or joined a little bit into it that you all know that we're gonna save about a third of our time together for questions. So please make use of the Q&A tab in Zoom. Um, you can type your questions in and then we will answer them for you um, live uh, at the end of the webinar. So um, I wanna make sure you're, you are aware of that question button um, and make use of it. I see a couple ones have already come in. Thank you so much. Um, so now at this point, we're going to turn um, from the halls of the Academy to uh, the halls of the 31st District Court um, in Hamtramck, Michigan, and hear from um, one of our judges who uh, is implement, has implemented this in her court and what her experience has been. So I am going to um, do one more slide and then I'm gonna hand it off to Judge Crott. Um, in this, this is for those of you who are maybe thinking about the um, ODR process in general for, um, uh, for courts, just showing you what um, the online flow looks like uh, in the Hamtramck court. Um, the defendant would come to the website um, to search, um, get, give their information into the assessment, maybe upload some supporting documents. Um, and then they might come back um, when they're notified to come back. The court clerk and the court judge are then participating in the process. Um, the, the clerk may validate, may notify if required. Um, the judge um, would review the information, set the plan, finalize the plan, um, and then invite the defendant to, to yes, initiate conversation with the defendant, defendant to, move, to move forward. Um, and then the system would um, notify and remind the defendant about compliance. So that's sort of generally how it works. But for the very specifics, we're going to um, dive in. I think we're answering one of the questions already in the Q&A with what it looks like. So handing it over to Judge Crott. And you may be on mute, Judge Crott. I can't hear you yet. If I could sing better, I would sing for you to fill this little bit of time. Um, Okay, um, she might have logged out and logged back in because I've lost my ability to chat with her. I can start this, but of course she's gonna be much better at this since she's the one who is in it. But the high level version of um, the scenario is that um, there's someone who's got an open court case. Um, in this case, this very cold looking woman wearing the blanket um, in the snow. Um, she needs to resolve it, but she can't get to court as she balances the conflicting demands of um, her challenging financial situation, her childcare, her job hunting, and her transportation issues. Um, I'm gonna keep going, Judge Crop, but when you, when you get here, please, um, please interrupt me and, and just jump in because you're gonna do this better. So we're gonna show you the um, in user interface here. And the user interface um, is shown here with pictures as if it was on a desktop computer, but it's fully um, responsive and mobile. 
um, that so it ensures a quality experience from any device. So this is what you would get if you went to the existing um, 31st District Court online ticket review website. Um, and in this case, um, Steffi would be hitting the button in the middle for past due. Um, she will have searched for her case and turns out, look at that, she's found her overdue case. Um, in this case, she's got an overdue amount on a speeding ticket. Um, she can continue um, and then ask for her case to be reviewed. At this point, she enters her email and her cell phone information. Um, and at this point, she starts her, her questionnaire, her assessment. So she's got, can get all the information that the judge is going to need to review her case together in an organized fashion ahead of time, rather than get to court, for instance, and have 13 of the 14 documents she needs and one is sitting on her kitchen table um, and, and they have to restart. So um, this is her online assessment, um, with, which has some guidance information for her so she can get started and know where, where she's going. And it turns out that people usually are typically completing this via a mobile device. So there's questions here. Um, if you choose the I, the I work full time answer, you get the ability to, um, it asks you questions about your average monthly income. However, in the second half, you can see on the side part of the screen, um, the questionnaire is smart if you say you are unemployed um, it doesn't ask you what your average monthly income is from employment, um, for instance, but it will still ask you the questions about your monthly income from sources other than employment. So the questionnaire will ask you the appropriate questions based on the answers that you've given in previous uh, to previous question. Um, other questions too about ownership of documents or ownership of uh, property, vehicle, savings investment accounts, um, filling it out, um, what types of um, payments that you have and what you owe on them, um, what other expenses that you have, and then if there are any special circumstances that should be considered. Um, these next few are defendant statements from that questionnaire. And I'm going to turn this over to JJ. Um, and, sure. and let me see if I can troubleshoot anything with Judge Crott. So Great. JJ, can you take the next couple defendant statements for me? Yeah, although I, I don't, I can't advance the slides. So I'm happy to. Okay. So these are, you know, slides. so these are, um, so these are our, our, our statements. So when, when people um, fill out the, um, the assessment, they, um, they can kind of add information about their situation to kind of add context. You could imagine this being the sort of open-ended question that a judge would ask to somebody who is appearing in open court to kind of explain their situation. Sometimes they're short, um, but they're often to the point and, 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 and clear. And one of the nice things you can imagine here is that somebody who is particularly uncomfortable speaking in public, who, who, who might just you know, choose not to even raise the issue, uh, or to put it off until later, um, uh, can spend time um, trying to think about exactly what, what they want to do, what they want to say, um, and, and so on. So let's uh, move to the next one, uh, Dunry. All right, so this is a little more, uh, a, a sort of a better uh, example of a, a more complete statement. Now, again, you can imagine somebody saying all of this in, um, in this sort of clear, uh, organized way in court, um, but this actually hits a lot of the key points, and you, know, you won't be surprised to learn that um, it seems likely that you know after having gone through the tool, including potentially uploading information, answering questions, uh, that it actually helps kind of organize um, uh, what uh, a defendant or offender might think is relevant to this consideration. So I'm a family of five with a disabled partner. I'm the only source of income. I'm currently facing an eviction. I'm always a month behind on rent. I'm also facing a shutoff for water and electric. So these are, you know, this is somebody who might have been um, primed for the fact that, you know, the amount you spend on utilities, um, uh, living, all these things matter in determining, um, uh, you know, wh whether or not you're going to be able 
uh, to pay. So note, note also at the end that this is a person who just says, listen, I'm, I'm happy to comply, um, but I, I just need help on figuring out how to re restructure this. Okay, so that doesn't mean that um, that uh, surely here is, you know, that, that that's the way the judge should go or necessarily has to go. There could be lots of other things uh, that the judge wants to take into consideration. Include and they, you know, they could even go further. They could decide based on the statement and other information that um, that uh, that the the amount you know should be reduced uh, or or wiped off altogether. So anyway, so there's a, there's an example. Um, Dunry, what's next? Okay, so here we go. Um, something similar, uh, real rough time in life. So this is a little more. Um, this is you know sort of a little more uh, 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 an explanation of of how they wound up um, uh, in the position of of, of having of, of having the uh, the ticket and and gives a little bit of uh, sort of their backstory, not just on their economic situation, but on their interaction with the with the court. All of which may be useful. Now, of course. Uh, when you have this kind of open, open-ended um, opportunity, you know, there's going to be some stuff that is occasionally submitted that you know is legally not relevant, um, but nonetheless may be um, useful in kind of shedding light on uh, some of the more uh, the, the the legally relevant considerations a judge wants to to look at. All right, let's go. What's next? Um, so here we go. Just another, just another example. I mean, uh, I mean, many of these are just interesting for getting a sense of the the kinds of people that have been using uh, this tool in Hamtramck. Um, uh, what is explaining uh, their inability to pay? Was it, well, whether they wind up with a warrant or um, or just are overdue? Uh, and you, you, know, you can see that people oftentimes have, um, you know, not surprisingly, dependents uh, that make it difficult for them to to actually find. Um, ways to, to make money to pay their fines. So, um, all right. Uh, again, somebody who is trying to put themselves in a better position and where we might worry that, you, you know, having, you know, caught a, an approach that causes this person to have their license suspended or alternatively um, forces them to, for example, not go to school in order to work um, could make sense in the very short run. Uh, but could in the long run um, be a, a much worse um, uh, choice. Okay, so, and then here's, you know, uh, just, they're all examples. So you, know, you see homelessness has popped up a couple of times. Um, uh, you know, people who, who, who have trouble affording things that we oftentimes think of as just uh, bare necessities, including um, access to a phone. Go ahead. Um, okay, so I'm not sure exactly what um, what we were going to do with this set of slides, Dunry, but this is this continues to, to sort of show uh, you know what the um, what the defendant um, sees. So notice up in the left hand corner, there's a box indicating uh, the status. This tool has been designed to be um, very friendly. Um, uh, the kind of um, uh, language is, it's used to be uh, understandable, easy to understand for somebody with an eighth grade education. Um, we've spent a lot of time trying to make sure that it's <clears throat> clear and, um, and kind of uh, helps people understand the process. Uh, we like to believe that it, um, it, it you know, in, in doing it once, we, it, it's sort of like designing a courthouse so that it's you know so it's really easy for everybody who walks through the door to know you know where they ought to go inside the courthouse. Um, uh, but of course, the nice thing about this is that we can we can adjust it. It's configurable. So of courts courts want to do it somewhat differently. Want to change the process, um, change how certain things appear. That's all possible. Thank you, JJ. I should have mentioned that way earlier when I was going over the defendant interface. He's right. Um, it's entirely configurable to the way that the court wants to communicate with, um, with people, with your people in your community. Including the kind of information that is collected. So, yes. you know, that, I mean, uh, you know, from the, from the beginning, that has been, uh, you know, a real goal of, of using this approach is not, is not trying to push courts to do it differently, but instead to, to give them technology that will allow them to do what they want to do uh, much more easily. 
Uh, and so if there's certain information or certain questions that you feel should be asked or shouldn't be asked, it's very easy um, uh, to, to reconfigure this so that it essentially mimics uh, sort of the best of all worlds from any particular court's perspective. Okay, so I don't know if you want to go on to the next slide. So this is this is how this is how the judge will will observe. Um, uh, well, you know, will will engage with uh, with these uh, litigants, with these defendants. Uh, essentially, something that looks a little bit like uh, an email inbox. Um, and there's you know a status. Again, we we sort of this this can also be adjusted in how it how it works. We've kind of added new tools and and um, uh, based on suggestions from users of how to make this work better. Um, but you'll see that um, over on the, on the right, there's a status uh, uh, report on where this is, you know, is and, and what uh, the, the judge needs to do. But I'm guessing that the next slide will be if you click through what you, you, what you might see. So, so here, um, the judge is gonna be able to kind of get in and observe all of the information uh, that the person has provided. Now they may want to do it the way they used to do it, which is to just kind of look at the things that they would have asked questions about um, in the same order they would have asked questions um, in open court, or they may prefer to, you know, to 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 you, you know to do it in some other way. Maybe uh, skip to the end to some kind of overall assessment if if that's built in um, uh, to a particular instance of the tool being used in a court. Go to the next one. Okay, so here's um, you know here's the, uh, the the opportunity for the judge to make a determination after reviewing all of the information that comes in. Uh, they can decide, you know, one payment. What's the amount going to be? Payment plan. How should it be structured? Whether or not um, the person can be accorded community service. Some of the courts using this, you, you know, are in favor of using community service. Others are not. That button or that option, that uh, option to use community service can be on the form or doesn't have to be on the form, it's sort of up to the court how they want it to appear. Um, uh, you'll see at the right uh, where there are notes, the judge can sort of uh, include notes to help them remember you know, why they did certain things, what concerns they had. And then if you see over in my templates, there's a little link there, judges are able to um, uh, essentially just structure kind of more standardized answer. So if they, they have a regular type of interaction with a particular court where somebody says, I don't know why this doesn't matter, or here's something, you know, some some argument they hear regularly, which in their, in the judge's view should, you know, doesn't matter or shouldn't matter to the determination, the, the judge can go to my templates and it will um, sort of pre-populate with uh, the language the, the judge likes to use. And, and it turns out that, you know, the, the you, a lot of our judges use these templates, and then kind of go in and kind of uh, individualize the email to, you know, especially you know, outside of the ability to pay context, but in the um, traffic context, for instance, helping to kind of engage with the with uh, the defendant, helping to explain why their argument makes sense or doesn't make sense. Um, it's actually really uh, quite remarkable. I mean, uh, you, you have to believe that at least a number of people who are are reading these communications directly from the judge really take it to heart when. For example, um, there, there's a lesson about how traffic law works, or um, in this case, you know whether something is relevant to the ability to pay determination in that court. Okay, so now you know after um, you know at a sort of all stages, there's sort of back and forth notification going on. So judges, you know, you saw their their little cue. You see that they kind of can keep track of where the case is. Um, uh, and uh, and litigants, users of the court, you know, also have sort of regular updates. Um, uh, there can be reminders um, uh, to to encourage compliance. Okay, you have uh, you have a payment coming due. Here's this link. You, can, you know, we, we sort of rely on text and 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 email to to do this. Uh, you can easily use the tool through a computer or through a tablet or through a phone. It looks really um, great. We're happy to show you if you want to take a look at it. But of course, again, this is all about sort of lowering the costs and making sure that, you know, the car doesn't drift off the road and wind up causing an accident. We want to keep people on the road towards compliance, which is better for courts and better for people. So I believe I have unmuted Justice Judge Crott. Um, did that happen? Or have I unmuted some of the wrong person? Judge Crott, are you speaking? 
Mm, it looks like I, boy, I'm having trouble with my. Do you want to hit me the next slide and I can try to keep going or? Yeah. Hey, Judge Crot, you look, you on mute now. Okay. There. All right, I will stand aside. I'm sorry. I, I, I hope I didn't take too much of your, uh, you know, of your, of your slides there. No, you did a great job, but I think you did all of them. No, no. Well, maybe, maybe you can uh, add some, add some thoughts about, uh, about anything I, you know, I might have missed or, or something that you know from your own experience. And, uh, and I don't know, actually, I don't know whether there are more slides for uh, Judge, Judge Kratz to comment on. No, we're, we're on the very last one. Um, but I, I think you did a great job, JJ. So we can just keep moving forward. And Judge Crot, there are some questions that you will be able to answer at the Q&A too, um, um, that are being queued up for you. So I will um, will bring you back in at that point. It must have been torture for you to listen to us present your slides, but I'm so happy we have you um, back with us um, by voice. So I'm glad this worked out. And okay, thanks everybody good. for sharing with us presenting um, Judge Crot's slides much worse than she would have done. But yes, here, so this, it doesn't apply as much in the world of ability to pay, but I wanted to make sure that we showcased the fact that um, Matterhorn can, um, ex when a court chooses to have um, signatures as part of a formal agreement at the end of a negotiation on the platform, that we um, allow that directly. You can sign on glass um, with your finger on your mobile phone, um, if the court allows that. Um, here in this particular slide is showing just that, where um, the agreement has been created. In this case, there's a plea. Um, they can choose um, how to plea and then sign um, and type the full name as the signature um, for the signature. And then here you can see how it looks on the mobile phone. So that doesn't apply in this particular, in Judge Crot's um, court, but um, it is some, something that people do courts do use as part of the platform. All right, so yes, we heard just right, a little so. bit of Judge Crot, and now I'm gonna be handing this right back to JJ to talk All about- All right, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna do this fast because we don't have too much time left. So, you know, we, you know we've been doing ability to pay now for more than a year and a half in a few courts. And um, and we have some we have some evidence to suggest that it's 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 been it's been great. So why don't you kind of move me through? So you know here's just some quick information about uh, people who are using the tool. So you can see that you know, some of the outcomes like the mean number of payments per in a payment plan, the mean amount that people have been asked to pay when they you know this is this you know the, the, I think the key thing um, uh, that uh, you, you know should come out of this is that that actually because this information is sort of collected um, automatically, it's actually quite easy for a court who wants to kind of understand trends or how you know, you know, to essentially benchmark uh, how they're doing things and to try to improve. It's really easy to pull the sort of the data out and to, and to study it. Um, so, you know, in, 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 in Hamtramck, the average, you know, number of days to, to approval or at least to consideration is, you know, it's less than a week. Um, and, uh, and, and, and in, in our view that from, some, from, the, from the point at which somebody actually sits down on their phone and, and submits this information, that's, that's pretty impressive relative to what they would have to do if they came into a court. All right, so, so ease of use, uh, you know, we just, we have at this point a bunch of comments, it's obviously hard to study in a rigorous way, ease of uh, use. Um, in theory, we could spend some time looking at uh, future changes to see how quickly people are able to get everything submitted. Um, uh, but what we have are just um, uh, uh, reports from uh, people who've used it, uh, suggesting that, uh, that, that it is actually um, easy, to, easy to use, although there's always ways to improve. Um, confidence in conclusions. So here, um, one of the great things about this is that all the data is one in one place. So it's all in one place and um, the tool allows distillation of the information. So you know, having a bunch of information about income and expenses and dependents and all of that, you, you, you know, is great, but it's hard to get the picture quickly. Um, 
but if you want, you can actually um, have it distilled into something like where does this person fit based on what they've submitted relative to the poverty line? How do they fit, for example, relative to other people um, uh, you know, in this jurisdiction? And, and in our view, having more information, easier to access, more comprehensive information makes for, um, makes for better uh, decision making. So here, see um, uh, some of these cases uh, uh, take uh, two to three minutes, some take more depending on the circumstances, uh, but the judge reports, you know, I get more information and better information doing it this way, having it sort of teed up for me um, in this easy to digest format than essentially extracting it by hand each time uh, somebody comes uh, uh, before uh, somebody, so uh, before the judge. Um, cases um, get handled uh, more quickly. It was already pointed out how much easier it is for somebody to kind of get this process going to have it resolved um, before, uh, uh, um, you know, relative to uh, the more traditional um, approach. So here's, you know, here's a, a, a judge comment about that. You know, two to three minutes, the system streams, streamlines it, giving me exactly the info I asked for, and the defendant also has the option to write me um, you a note know as they do. Um, so. <clears throat> uh, you'll notice the last little, uh, uh, the last little phrase there. It saves us a lot of time, and I, you know, I think that's critical because ultimately, you know, of course, saving time in and of itself is is great for courts. But what's also important to realize is that when things take a long time to do, you know, they're not done as well, and they are oftentimes skipped if the person doesn't really make it clear they want to do it. So, you know, so in our view, when things take um, less time, they're easier to do. There are a lot more people who are likely to benefit from this kind of access. And, and, it, and, and in this circumstance, what, you know, in this context, what that means is we're going to wind up having much more accurate um, outcomes. Okay. So it reduces access costs. I mean, I think this is based on the ease of use. It's, you know, there's much here to show, like obviously people don't have to, to go to the courthouse. They can submit things by uploading through their phone. Um, so at least for a large chunk of people, um, this is much easier. I want I'll, I want to make sure to to comment that um, to add that you, you know th this option is just an option. So in all of the ways we've used Matterhorn, we've never never sort of a, a, you know suggested the court. I, I don't think any court has actually done it. Sort of eliminated the traditional avenue. This is just you know if you can't make it if you can make it downtown, you prefer to use the court um, house in person. Great. If that's really hard for you to do because getting to court during business hours is difficult, then you can use this much less costly um, approach. Um, and, and we know in talking to people who've used uh, Matterhorn and in particular this ability to pay tool uh, that a lot, of, a lot of people would just not have been able to go. In other words, they would just been deemed refu you know, refusing to pay, would not have been able to make their case and would have eventually had a warrant or um, you know, had their license suspended. Um, I mean, wouldn't have been put on a payment plan. So of course the court winds up collecting less. People wind up in a, a, in a not great situation of being um, uh, on the outs with the court, potentially having a warrant out for their arrest. And, um, and, and you, you know, it seems like a good chunk, if not a, a large majority of, of the people using this tool would have been in that position. Um, we also, in, you know, in, in talking to people who've actually used this tool, you know, one question is like, do you feel like this is, is fair? Now, of course, the people who use the online approach have the option, and we will make sure they know that they have the option of doing it another way. So in that sense, we have people who are more comfortable with this. But even though we have a number of people who, you know, who, who, who make requests that aren't granted, Right, they you know they say I want to pay less or I want to pay on a payment plan, and you know that that request is not always granted. It's of course judges um, decide how um, uh, you know based on what they see before them. We still have a you know pretty strong showing uh, among users that you know this is fair. It works out well. And um, and and you know the communication improvement I think is I'm not sure I think it should be fairly obvious that. Um, you know, that if you have to come in and speak with somebody one-on-one, -on -one, that obviously reduces uh, uh, the sort of regularity and the, and the comprehensiveness of the communication. If you forget to say something, well, that's too bad. Um, uh, you, you, you know, the fact that you have this space where you can communicate with, with the judge to help educate them on your status is incredibly useful. And I'll also add that it actually 
makes things, at least in some circumstances, easier on judges who might want to ask certain questions or might want to um, comment on uh, potential options for somebody, but are, are uncomfortable doing so if it's gonna happen in a wide open room with lots of people. And so the kind of the direct connection um, uh, can, can free the judge to give sort of um, uh, potentially better, better advice and to explore even better um, ways of dealing with um, the outstanding uh, compliance problem. Um, and I'm gonna just uh, wanna hand it back to Judge Crott for this, um, the next two, but I also wanna make sure we leave them a couple of minutes for questions, so um, back to you, Judge Crott. Okay. okay, you can hear me now, though. Yes. Okay. Yes. All right. So, um, and this this is the um, the words here are perfect. That and it is embarrassing for people to come in, ask for a payment plan, and I don't always get through all of the correct questions. That I, I don't have all the information I need with the online system. It alleviates that. The same. Everyone has the same questions, and the only person seeing it is me, not. 50 people sitting in the courtroom listening to this person have to put all their problems out in public. Um, and also with our, the way that, and then Dunry, can you go to the next slide, please? The way that our court does it um, is as soon as the person makes two payments, the warrant is recalled. So they still have the outstanding issue, but there's no longer a bench warrant. And that's just our policy. I'm sure other courts have different policies, but it has led to a, a great reduction in the bench warrants that we have in our system. And that's good for um, the, the court users as well. That's huge. That brings us really back to the, the beginning motivation for um, us getting started at all. Um, this, I'm gonna, rush us through this slide, which is recap of the assessment tool benefits that JJ went and Judge Crott went over and get to your questions. Um, Judge Crott, I'm going to give you the first questions to you. Um, there's two related questions. Um, what type of notification does a litigant receive to learn about this ATP assessment? Is it included in a summons or other notice? Thank you. And the second half of that question is, um, uh, how does your court publicize this service, other forms besides website? So um, it is actually on the bottom of, our tra of the traffic tickets that our police department issues. It has the link to the, it has the Matterhorn website listed. Um, and then we have our court website, which is obvious through, through your question. And then we did a couple press releases. And when people call in, our clerks tell them you can come to, if you, if you want to know about payments, you can come in on a walk-in day or you can use the online system. And I'm pretty sure that they can email them, the person who's calling a link mm -hmm. so that they have that information right, um, easily accessible to them. Um, thank you, Judge Crott. I have another question. This may be, um, it depends on how, how much you know about um, exactly how your clerks use it. So this may be um, a question we'll have to get back to if you don't have an answer off the tip of your tongue. But Abby Graves has asked, how do the clerks validate information received from the defendant? How much time are they spending on this? They don't validate the information. We just, um, whatever the person sends in, I assume that it's true, just like I would in the courtroom. We don't, I don't ask anyone for a rent receipt or to look at their water bill or anything like that. I just assume that what they put in the system is true. The time that the clerks spend on it, um, the, it does go to the clerks first. They verify maybe not verify, verify is the wrong word, but they do somehow handle, um, they pull the file and put it in my basket. We do still have some paper here at the court, but they don't spend any time verifying the information. Thank you. Um, this is a question I believe that um, both JJ and Judge Crott will have been asked in the past on this. Um, Terry McCord asked, will the truly poor have access to online services? Uh, shall, shall I take a stab at that? Um, I mean, uh, the, 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 the answer is 
you know, that's a concern. So, you know, I mean, increasingly the digital divide is shrinking. Um, you know, we, we do have, however, an example of somebody who used the system even though they can't afford a phone. Um, so really ultimately what you need is access to a smartphone uh, and, um, and it is increasingly rare that somebody doesn't at least know somebody that they trust that would have access to a phone. But it is a real issue, and that's one of the reasons why, at least for a while, it seems uh, inappropriate for any court to go entirely to running um, uh, any kind of determination solely online. So, you know, from our perspective, there are a bunch of people who can use this technology and it's very difficult for them to get to court. So if, you know, if this is one option they can use, great. Of course, if you don't have uh, the ability to access the internet or a smartphone or a computer, um, you're no worse off because you can go in and, and use the court as you did before. And actually, in some ways, you're much better off because now the court is much less crowded. We have some evidence in some other contexts that you, you, know, you wind up waiting a lot less. It's much faster. People are more satisfied because a lot of people who do have access to the internet take care of their things um, in advance. Um, and one of our um, attendees just chimed in, Lisa Fusick. She says that they use public terminals to allow for defendants to use the online option. So that's an FYI from um, District Court 14A in Washtenaw County. So they do um, make sure that that is available to people who can come um, to the public terminals. Um, uh, there are other questions um, here. I know we just have one, mo one minute more officially. Um, so I um, will but I can stay on a little longer to make sure these questions are, are answered. And of course we can follow up by email to, um, to get your questions answered as well. I'm gonna ask one um, from um, Joe Tomasino. Um, if a defendant has multiple cases, do they need to complete multiple assessments? Judge Crott, how does your court handle this? They're all in one. Oftentimes the, if they're, I see this a lot. Typically a person who will have two or three unpaid civil infractions and then they may have a, a misdemeanor that's not resolved. And I will give them a payment plan on the defaulted civil infractions. And then there is a box where you can send them a note. And I say, you know, this, the payment plan is just for the civil infractions. Come in and talk to me about your bench warrant. You won't be arrested as long as you walk in. Um, so yes, you can handle everything on one with one transaction. Um, maybe this is a good place to end. Um, uh, Chanel Daniels asked, will this presentation be emailed to everyone that participated in the webinar? Absolutely. You will receive a link to um, the full archive of the webinar. So you'll be the, the recording of the video um, as well as the slide deck will be available to you after the um, after the date, it just takes the, you know, the system a little while to get the, the video available, but you can have the full presentation. So thank you for participating, for your um, uh, attendance and your interest and your good questions. Um, I'm sorry for all the questions that we weren't able to answer, um, but we will answer those offline. Um, and yes, I'm going to repeat one of the questions that was just added by, um, Deborah Hataja Deratani, and uh, forgive me if I've um, not pronounced your name correctly, who says, thank you so much to Judge Crott and JJ. And I heartily agree. Thank you, Judge Crott, um, for your contribution. I'm sorry we had trouble with your audio. <laughs> and thank you, JJ, for jumping in and playing, um, playing two roles today. Happy to help. And if anybody wants to reach out to me at the University of Michigan, feel free to do so. Okay. Um, and one, yep, uh, one more question I am going to answer real quick as we go out, which is how many courts are currently using this platform and how many states where Matterhorn has expanded um, to 45 courts in eight states. And, and please get a hold of us if you would like a reference um, to talk to someone um, who is using the software. So thank you so much. I appreciate all of your time and interest and for making time in your day for this important topic. All right. I'll see you next time. Oh, wait, next time is this small budget, big impact, uh, June 13th.
See you there. Okay. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye.